Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to jam your hands together as we bring up on stage Anita Posh. Um, I'm here to talk about how Bitcoin empowers Africa and Africans empower Bitcoin. And um, I want to thank you all for having me the second time for the second edition of this conference. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here again. So I have spent the last, in the last three years, I've spent a lot of time, over 12 months, in different African countries, like in Zimbabwe, Zambia, South Africa, here in Ghana, of course, to learn about the situation on the ground. Because when I started with Bitcoin, I heard a lot about how Bitcoin solves the problem of hyperinflation for people who live in countries with a lot of inflation. But then always people mentioned Zimbabwe. But no one of these people has ever been to Zimbabwe before. And I thought, I want to go there. I want to learn from the people on the ground and support them in any way I'm able to do that. And so in February 2020, I came the first time to Zambia. And I also visited Botswana, the Satoshi Center, uh, to learn about how Alakanani Itiri Leng, for instance, was doing her work there. And, um, Last year, in 2022, I came back and visited Bitcoin Ikasi in South Africa um, and was here doing a meetup with uh, the Bitcoin Cowries, for instance. And I really have to say, I learned a lot uh, from you all. And I want to speak about how I believe that Bitcoin empowers Africa. Now, I would like to show you a map of uh, the Democracy Index, which shows us that 55% um, of the global population have to live in authoritarian ruled countries. And a lot of these countries are sadly in Africa. And at the same time, the wealth map shows us that also the countries with the people with the least wealth are also mostly in Africa. And this is not a coincidence, I believe, um, because in authoritarian-led countries, very often, the situation is that, that people have to hassle all the time. Infrastructure is broken, and so you actually don't have the energy or the power to build resistance. And I think this is a, a tool, basically. And also, um, with high inflation, like for instance in Ghana, it's 30 to 40 percent a year. You can't really, thank you. So yes, um, that's the slide to inflation. And um, speaking of inflation, yeah, let's take the example of Zimbabwe, for instance. And uh, this is a typical Zimbabwean bread. Everyone buys it, everyone eats it. And in 2019, it, was, it cost one US dollar. And in 2019, also the government of Zimbabwe decided to reissue the Zimbabwean dollar. And what they did was they forcibly exchanged all US dollar accounts of Zimbabweans in Zimbabwe to Zimbabwe dollar accounts. And they told people, don't worry, the value will stay the same. Uh, the exchange rate will not change, it will be one-to-one. -one. So that was in early 2019. When I came in 2020 the first time, it was already one to 28, and last year it really exploded. Like in January this year, it was 850, and now it's about one to 4,000. So monetary inflation, is inherent in the traditional financial system. And Bitcoin is an exit because there can't be any monetary inflation in Bitcoin and no government, no central bank can uh, change the issuance of Bitcoin. And that's also a reason why many countries try to ban Bitcoin. Of course, they dislike it because it's non-governmental money and they can't control it. Instead, they want you to use the CBDC, like in Nigeria, the e-Naira, that they can control. But Bitcoin is, like my teacher Andreas Antonopoulos said, is a ripcord. It's a lifeline, basically, that helps you to exit the current financial system. Why is it a ripcord? It's revolutionary, it's immutable, it's public, it's collaborative, 
it's open, it's resistant to censorship, and it's decentralized. And I believe two of two very important uh, factors or properties are the openness. As my speaker, the first speaker said, anyone can use Bitcoin. You don't need an ID. You, did, you don't need a verification from your government or anything else. So it's basically financial inclusion. And the censorship resistant means that no government, no one, can take away your Bitcoin or freeze your assets, which is happening very often. Bitcoin empowers human rights activists. It enforces freedom of speech and freedom of association. In such, there's when, when like uh, human rights organizations receive funds from abroad, their government can't seize these funds anymore like they can on bank accounts. Another opportunity for African countries and areas is to build out Bitcoin mining with hydropower. A lot of countries could end their uh, dependence on foreign countries and their indebtedness when they sell out their rare earths or their gold reserves to other countries when they started Bitcoin mining. There are two companies here, like Gridless and Big Block Data Center, who are already mining on the ground in African countries. Then interestingly enough, I mean, the banking fees in South Africa are higher than in Germany. Who would have thought that? And as you all know, I mean, banks, no one really trusts banks, you know? Banks are slow, they are bureaucratic. Uh, sometimes they freeze your money. I know people in Zimbabwe who are using Bitcoin and have unbanked themselves, although they could have, they had a bank account, but they didn't want to use it anymore. And they exchange Bitcoin to US dollar peer to peer whenever they need it. But all this power, you only have it when you use Bitcoin in self custody, when you own the keys to your Bitcoin. And that's why I think that education and utility, of course, are important for the adoption of Bitcoin. And also an interesting st thing is this number. 28, 20 years is the median age of Africans, whereas the median age in Europe is 43. So where do you think Will a new technology that breaks power structures, is innovative and uh, new, will be used more? In these countries where young people are, it's a no-brainer for me. Of course it will, because the need is much higher. The utility for people in these countries is much higher than in the global north. So how do Africans now empower Bitcoin? Because this is not a one-way street. At the moment, that's a map of Bitrefill, the African cryptocurrency economy is small compared to the size of the continent and to the number of the population. But it's different. And it's also small, I think, because there are a lot of scams, sadly. I mean, scams are everywhere, and also you have a lot of altcoins, and people don't know the differences. And so I think it's also important to know that it's a scam when you need to buy a starter package, when you need to bring a friend or a family member, or you need to do monthly payments. And of course, no one in Bitcoin will profit, uh, promise you a profit because you can't promise anything. And there's also no need to join Bitcoin because as I said before, it's open for anyone to use. You don't need someone to, to uh, maintain or help you with your Bitcoin. You can do it yourself. So what I have observed in the North, Bitcoin is more used as a store of value, as a long-term investment. Whereas in the Global South, here in African countries, it's more like a medium of, of exchange, a tool that people use in their day-to-day -day lives. But Bitcoin can, can be both. And it is both. It's a medium of exchange and a store of value. If you hold it long enough, I would say at least three to five years, it's a perfect store of value. 
And with new technologies like the Lightning Network or FEDI, e, the FEDI eCash system, it's also a fast and cheap and very private way uh, to, pay your to pay your daily bills. Another way how Africans contribute is the usage is mostly peer-to-peer -peer without KYC, which is great for the rest of the world too. Because as long as here people are exchanging Bitcoin without KYC, then there will be a market for that uh, privacy-protecting way to use Bitcoin. And the adoption actually has been huge. As I said before, in 2020, when I came the first time, I only knew about uh, the Satoshi Center in Botswana. And now we have these many initiatives on the African, in African countries. And I'm sure this will grow in the coming years. So now we have Bitcoin data in Kenya, the Bitcoin cowries, <laughs> yes, the Bitcoin cowries in Ghana, Bitcoin for Fairness in Zambia, the Bitcoin Innovation Hub in Uganda, and Bitcoin Ekazi in South Africa, and many, many more. And one by one, Africans will see how Bitcoin can help them to empower themselves and to gain financial freedom. And they can even do that without the internet. There's a slide missing. That's an image of Machankura 8333. Uh, a tool built by South African developer Kodatsu, and you can send Bitcoin without the internet. Yeah, you can really do that. And that you can see how innovative people are here. And then Femi was the speaker before me. I also want to mention Be Trust Builders because it's a very, very important project and educational program because I'm absolutely convinced from all I've seen here that only African developers can really build the solutions that are needed here on the ground. And so I think all sorts of educational programs are very, very important. And with what I've been doing in the last three years, which was workshops, talks, media interviews, yeah, just trying to get the word out about, about what Bitcoin really is, these events are great to build trust on the ground to show people Bitcoin is not a scam, it's a real tool. But I believe that's not enough, at least for me it wasn't enough. I wanted to build something that can help others on the ground to share education with their peers. And that's the reason why I started Crack the Orange, an online learning program especially for trainers or aspiring Bitcoin educators and community builders here in African countries to help them gain knowledge, the knowledge that they might need to share their knowledge with their peers then on the ground. So I'm sure that Bitcoin adoption will skyrocket in the coming years. But Bitcoin isn't really perfect yet. We need scalable solutions to onboard the first billion of users. We need more privacy in Bitcoin to protect individuals and human rights activists from surveillance. And also, we need you. Bitcoin doesn't have a marketing department or an education department or a sales department. So each one of you could start their own program or your podcast or uh, just show your family and your friends how easy and great it is to use Bitcoin. So, and if you want to become an educator or a community builder, we are giving away, thanks to our donors, we can give away scholarships for that educational program. And you just need to apply at anita.link slash apply. And with that, I hope I see many of you online or maybe here later today. Thank you.